everybody. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> There's a running joke. So um, for those of you who don't know, we did a, it was May Day video that was really like an April Fool's in May video because we totally screwed the deadline for April Fool's. Uh, so we did it in May and I was dressed as a leprechaun and had a very thick Irish accent. And now for some reason, every time I say, hello, everybody, these guys look at me like I sound Irish See, all the time. Was, I was just going to say that time you didn't do it. Hello, everybody. There you go. Hello, everybody. Math is hard. Uh, this is where we need video. Talking's hard. Uh, so welcome back. We are here today with Sam Masiello. Did I say that right? Masiello. Masiello. See, I know I was going to say it wrong. <laughs> um, who is the chief information security officer for the Gates Corporation here in Denver. This guy is a titan in his own right when it comes to all things technology, security, network security, um, and so we are thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have you here to, with us today. And we thank you for braving the the crazy streets around the art district <laughs> in Denver to find our little hole and uh, come hang out with us today. Well, thank you for having me. You're very, it. Yeah. So why don't you start, just take a few minutes and tell people a little bit about your background and um, how'd you get into security um, and anything else about yourself you want us to know. Sure. So um, I, I find myself to be a bit of a... I, I call it a unicorn in security, as it were, because um, I've always known I wanted to be in security in some way, uh, where a lot of people, they kind of fall into it. You know, mm -hmm. they have an IT job, they have a tech job, and then somebody comes to them one day and says, hey, we need to build security. So here, go go figure this out. <laughs> right? and, it, and it becomes something to just kind of do off the side of their desk. Security is an afterthought. It is. Yeah. It is. And, and I'll say that is the case in a lot of cases here today, too. Uh, but I've always known I wanted to be in security. I ran my first uh, messaging systems when I was 13 years old. And so uh, seeing the abuses that were happening on the internet and seeing how security was starting to evolve and security was very different back then, right? There, it, was, it was before, you know, the internet was mainstream. And so the, the way we think about security then and the abuses that were happening then are very different from what we're seeing today. Absolutely. Uh, but it captured my interest and I knew it was always something I wanted to do, but I also enjoy teaching. And so I got to this crossroads when I was in high school where I'm like, do I want to get into security or do I want to get into teaching? And I've been blessed throughout my career to be able to have roles that allowed me to do both, where I've been able to be in security or take on security roles, implement security programs, but also have the opportunity to be able to go out into, into the world and speak. And so that's been my opportunity to teach by not necessarily teaching in a classroom, although I have done that in a few cases as well. I've done, a, done some guest lecture uh, roles in the past, but I do a lot of conference speaking and that's been my opportunity to be able to kind of leverage both of my desires to pursue security, but also be able to teach as well. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. And so I've, I've had some great opportunities over the course of the years, uh, worked at some great companies that allowed me to spread my wings in various ways and meet lots of really influential people in the security space that have, that have not only taught me a lot of things, but also you know, I've been able to uh, bring that experience into the companies that I've worked for as well. Uh, and it's, it's, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. You know, it, it's, it's definitely a field where you get to learn something new all the time. If you are not learning something new, then you're falling behind. You know, mm. I, I generally liken it to a snowball rolling downhill Yeah. where, you know, if you're standing still, the snowball is always getting further, further and further away, away from you. Yeah. Where if you're constantly learning and attempting to keep up with that snowball, uh, then at least you stand a chance. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the security space is one where, you know, the bad guys are always coming up with new and interesting and innovative ways to do things on a daily basis. And so if we're not learning what those tactics are and how to keep up with them, then we have, we don't stand a chance. Right? You can't defend against something that you don't understand. Yeah. Are you a hacker? I uh, used to be. Used to be. Yeah. Okay. okay. Not, not hardcore, but, um, but yeah, I, I could, I could get my way into things. Okay. Uh, which is, which is also, which also kind of fed my, my security desires as well. Right. Cause I've, I've run some QA departments in the past, so I got to break stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I've always had this, this passion for, for breaking things, but also being able to use that knowledge on how to break things to make it better, to make it better. Yeah. That's better. awesome. So how fast is the snowball moving right now? Very fast. Yeah. V uh, faster than most technology is keeping up faster than the laws are keeping up in a lot of cases. And so, you know, mm. we're, we're constantly in this game of, of catch up. It but, seems like with that, with that amount of, of attack that, the only reason everything isn't falling apart is because there's so many targets. Basically, you 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 haven't been attacked yet just because you're you're not as visible yet. You know, when I well, I'll get to you. I, I would <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that's true. I'd say there's two types of companies, and this is a fairly common phrase you'll hear in security. 
is that there are companies who have been hacked and there are companies who don't know they've been hacked. <laughs> there, 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 there really aren't many companies who, who haven't been hacked at all. Um, you know, if you're small enough, then you're probably not on someone's radar, but you don't even necessarily have to be on someone's radar, right? Yeah. We just had one of our clients on his beta alpha portal that he's working on while we're working on the app and the IoT side. The other day, he went onto the website and was asked to pay six bitcoins. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they point the zero database. six mm-hmm. bitcoin. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> about six hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, yeah. So and it's so like, whoops, we've been hacked. Yeah, and and, it, and it's not even that they were necessarily targeted. No, these guys send out these mass it's emails to just yeah. float through and find whatever they can. Yeah. and they, they just try to grab. Yeah, exactly. They try to get whatever they can. Yeah. Now, in some cases, when you're dealing with nation state attacks, nation state actors, you know, there there are some very targeted attacks that occur against some of your larger companies. But in a lot of cases, it's just some guy spending out as any as many emails as he possibly can, trying to see what credentials he can get, seeing what uh, computers he can get locked up to get them to pay Bitcoin to get their data back. It's 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 a very big business. Yeah. You know, as much as you don't like to think about it as business because it's not legitimate or legal business, but it's it's business. Yeah. And and in some countries, uh, I think we've all probably seen the emails over time where uh, you know you get the email from the Nigerian prince offering you. <laughs> 20 million US dollars, right? There, there are factories. I made to reply to that this morning. <laughs> you'll, you'll get it someday. Just keep trying. Uh, but there are, there are factories of these places in some countries where, you know, people are there sending out these emails, responding to these emails, and they're protected. Oh, by like a boiler room, essentially. Yeah, more or less. And these, these little factories are protected by law enforcement and by the government because the systems are so corrupt that you know, you'll have a room with like 20 people sitting at computers trying to break into things and, and scam people. And the cops stay away from them because the guy who runs the operation is slipping the money on the side. What? And you know, they're not making much money to begin with. So Do if, you think if that's you, happening in the U.S.? Uh, probably not so much in the U.S. Okay. Uh, it might, but okay. probably not so much in the U.S. But definitely in third world countries where salaries are low, people are unemployed, people are trying to do whatever they can to make money. In a lot of cases, these people who are working in these little factories... They don't know what they're doing is illegal. Right. You know, they're just doing, they're just doing their job. Right. They're given a job, they do their job and they, they're just, they're just sitting there doing what they're told to do. Right. And then it's the guy who runs the operation, who's the one on the backside, you know, slipping the, the cash to law enforcement. So law enforcement leaves them alone because the law enforcement official is like, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm getting extra money on the side, so I'm going to leave them alone. While at the same time, these guy gets to continue his illegal operation. Man. And in many times there are countries that have no reciprocity with the U.S. either. And so they're just allowed to do their thing. And if, you know, while the, while the U.S. is trying to, to find these guys and bring them to justice, the countries are like, we don't know. We don't care. Yeah, we don't know. We don't care. Yeah. So they're not all Russian then? <laughs> not all. No. So then they're, it, all, they're it, all over the place. Okay. All That's over the place. what seems to lead, lead me to think that technical solutions are really the only ones that you can really rely on because you can't rely on judicial solutions or legal solutions everywhere. It, it's a combination of, I would say, education and technology solutions. So mm. you, you definitely need to make sure your people are aware mm. of what a threat looks, acts, and smells like. Uh, you know, so we, we all worked caught. at a company yep. a couple of years ago that um, they had a new person in accounting, was it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he got an email that said it was from one of the partners in the company mm-hmm. that said, I need W-2 records yep. for the last two years for all employees. Yep. First of all, why do you need that? Let me walk up to your office and ask you why you need that. Mm-hmm. But yeah. He attached everybody's W-2s and emailed it back Mm -hmm. and he he got a fake return filed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Several people did. Several people did. Yeah. Yeah. It took me like two years to get my returns from that. It's, that's been a, that was a fairly common thing a few years ago. I think they've put some measures in place to kind of mitigate some of that now. Mm -hmm. But a few years ago, that was a huge problem where W-2s were getting stolen. And effectively what these guys would do was they would file a return on your behalf before you had a chance to file it. That's exactly what happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. So is the, is the biggest source or, or access point for, for a common type of breach that you see the average employee who's unaware opening or, or clicking on an email? Yes. Uh, most, most of the attacks that are occurring today require very little skill on the part of the attacker to execute and be successful at. Because so, they're exploiting that the person on the other side has right. probably even less skill than them. That's right. That's right. Wow. So they just, they get an email that looks legitimate. They click on a link and they give up their credentials. The next thing you know, they have, you know, the the scammers have access into the organization at that point. Yeah. Or they get access to the right person and they get access to personal data and they can start sweeping important financial data out of the company. But yeah, it's, most of these things are happening because employees are unaware and because the technology in some cases that they have deployed 
isn't good enough to identify. Right. And what happens in a lot of cases too is that when when these sorts of scams are happening, they're they're typically uh, impersonating an executive at the company. Mm. So another type of scam we see like, fairly regularly yeah. is uh, there'll be a, it's, it's effectively a wire fraud scam where you get an email that looks to be from the CEO or the CFO of a company, and it's to random payroll specialist, right? And it's, hey, are you around? I need you to process a payment for me. I need to pay an invoice. We have this supplier that's late in getting paid. Mm. Can you please help me facilitate this, this payment today? And so the person says, oh, yes, uh, you know, Mr. CEO, Mrs. CEO, I'm more than happy to help oh, you with that happy. because they are, they are influenced by the authority of the person in that position. Which is exactly what happened at that other company. Yep. Yeah. And so there was a, and so this, this is happening on a fairly regular basis. And then, so these, these uh, funds are being wired offshore to offshore bank accounts. And at that point they're gone. They're gone. They're yeah. gone. And so an FBI, the FBI has been tracking this for the past few years. And I forget what the n- most recent number is, but um, this has been a problem that has been increasing exponentially over the, ca- over the course of the past few years to where it is, I think it's well over $10 billion in losses now that have been reported from companies just because of these types of Wire Holy fraud scams. moly, Which, yeah. 10 I was gonna billion ask, with, a we, with a B. With a B. What are we B. looking at like total? Do, is there is there a, a dollar figure on total losses? That's hard to say, year? right? Because the only number they, they can report on are the numbers of from people who actually report no, to them. Yeah. yeah so there's, there's a lot that actually happens under the hovers that never gets reported that companies just deal with and, you know, don't want to. Don't they want don't to talk wanna, about. They don't want to publicize. No, no. It's they don't want shareholders to know that happened. That's right. It's embarrassing. Oh, gosh. It's embarrassing. And I, I, there are certain rules that apply to public companies that don't apply to private right, companies. That's but, true. But it's happening that's all true. the time. It's happening all the time. And that, which is why these guys continue to do it. Right. Yeah. If, it, if it weren't successful. If it wasn't working, they'd, they'd something. find something else. That's right. Oh, man. Man. So it's not even, it's not even like complex or or clever no. hacking going on. This no. is literally like the average employee sitting in front of their computer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, oh, so we, uh, everybody everybody should know by now, we sit in Colorado Voice Clinic, my fiance, who has showed up in our videos, interrupting our videos many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he runs Colorado Voice Clinic and we help with the IT here. And a few years ago, we locked down all the computers so that people couldn't install anything mm-hmm. on them. Because his PA is notorious because he's older. He doesn't, he's not familiar with what's really appropriate in an email or not. And to this day, I mean, just like three days ago, he got an email that was one of the Nigerian prints. And, Mm -hmm. you know, your cousin said that you might be somebody who could help bridge this thing. And he, he still like sits there for a few minutes looking at it until he finally looks over at David and is like, is this real? <laughs> like, how would I do this? And David's like, oh my gosh, delete the email, mm-hmm. you know? And he, I was so worried that he was going to double click on an executable of some kind and open up a firewall. And with all the HIPAA data mm-hmm. on all of our servers, right. uh, it, right. you know, that's terrifying. It's a huge risk. Yes. Yeah, it's a huge yes. risk. Is there something, so that, that brings up the point that I'm sure this could be <clears throat> controversial, but is there uh, is there something to that as far as age? You know, is there something about, a certain segment of, of the population, especially Americans, once we reach a certain age, we tend to be more susceptible to those kind of things. Or is it a factor they of didn't grow up the they didn't grow up with the technology? I, I think it's I think it's more the latter, okay. right? They're, 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 it's something that they're not used to seeing, and so yeah. they, there's there's still that trust element in mm-hmm. email as being oh. you know something that hey, I got this email. They must have known how to send it to me or how to send it to me and get it to my inbox. So it must be legitimate, Somebody right? You know, that. a lot of the spam filters are pretty good now about blocking yeah. most of the most of the junk. Yeah. Uh, but some of this stuff gets through every now and again. And so I think it's just this, mostly a lack of awareness as to the fact that this is happening on a regular basis. These scams are occurring and that people are out there trying to take advantage of you where for people who grew up the technology, it's just kind of part of what you, what you're used to every day. But even then people still get tricked by this stuff. I mean, yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, are, are we, we're not saying that millennials or Gen Y or Z like never get sucked no, into it or that like our kids growing up with all this technology, they're, they're just the yeah. scam, the scammers and the spammers and everybody, they're just going to get smarter. Right. That's right. Yes. And that's why we're saying the snowball's rolling very fast. I've gotten downhill. caught by it within the last five years. I mean, it was a different variation on, on what, this. What, what was yours? It was, uh, um, someone who was, who was passing off a rental property as their own. Oh. And I had sent them a lot of information. Thankfully, I didn't send them credit card or uh, uh, social security information. Yeah. Um, and right at the last minute, my spidey sense kicked in. Mm-hmm. And so I drove over to the property and knocked on the door. And uh, the lady said, I've actually had this happen a couple of times. Oh. 
And so I reached out, I think it was, um, was it Zillow? I think. Yeah. Uh, I reached out to them and said, Hey, this is a false. They were using Zillow. They were, that's where I found it was Zillow. Wow. I said, Hey, this is false. I had to go back and forth with Zillow several times because they were like, really? no, 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 we have pretty sophisticated. I'm like, clearly like, you don't because this, this is fake. Mm-hmm. This and is I not talked real. to the lady who just bought the property within the last year. It's not for rent. You need to take this listing down. Wow. But um, interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And, and they're starting to get more targeted against specific uh, professions as well. I mean, you see a lot of the the kind of the run of the mill spray and pray as I like to call a type of spam that kind of goes out <laughs> yeah. to everybody. It's fairly generic, but they're targeting, as I mentioned earlier, executives at organizations or people within organizations. They're targeting the real estate space as well, where one of the things, uh, it's one of the things I, I like to do is real estate investment as well. So yeah. I, I have some brokers that I, or um, agents that I work with. And one of the things that they're very much on high alert for is uh, for title companies. What they're trying to do is, is scam these title companies so that instead of funds being wired to, the seller's, the seller's account. It, it's being wired to some other account. And so mm. what happens is these these uh, these properties get sold. And hundreds of thousands of dollars go just, just disappear. somewhere. Disappear. Yeah. Whoa. Man. And so then the, then the people who bought the property are in a situation because the seller the, never got the, the money. The settlement didn't actually happen. Exactly right. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's insane. Yeah. So that's is insane. That, is, uh, is that foreign actors? Because I would imagine... To do something like that in this country, you'd have to have pretty intimate knowledge of, of our real estate structure. Uh, I wouldn't even say it's that far. I mean, they, they, these guys are pretty good at doing their reconnaissance on companies before really? they go after them. So it's, okay. more, it's more just a matter of identifying the company that's in that field. Yeah. Now, I guess they would have to try to find out some transaction that was taking place. Yeah. So there may already be a compromise within that organization. So it's not just a, you know, a generic hey, wire this money over here. Right? Yeah. They, have, they have to have some way to get in so that they have knowledge of the transactions the about to take place. And all that. Oh, wow. Uh, so there's more to it than that. But that's where you start to get into some of the more industry-specific things that are happening on a more regular basis. So it's, it's, it's more, which is why awareness is so important on top of the technology because the technology, when things get so specific and so targeted, isn't necessarily- It's necessar- harder to see it. It is. It's yeah. going to be more difficult for the technology to identify it. And so you have to rely on your people to be aware of if you see something like this, or if you get something that looks like this, or if you get something from somebody that looks like this, this is probably not true. Or yeah, stop th- you, and get up and go walk and talk to somebody. Exactly. Yeah. Or have a process in place to make right. sure that you can prevent things like that from happening. So what happens yeah. in a lot of cases, especially with these wire fraud scams, is the reason they're successful is because the person who's getting scammed is going outside a process. Mm. Because a lot of companies have a process. If you want to make a payment to a vendor you follow this process and there's these checks and balances that are in place. And there's people who have to review and approve these sorts of things. You don't just go into the system and make the change or make the payment. Another example that we're also seeing now is same sort of vehicle, but uh, instead of facilitating wire fraud payments, they're redirecting direct deposit. So they'll go to a payroll specialist, for example, and say, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll structure the email to make it look like it's coming from some company executive. Yep. And they'll say, hey, uh, I've changed bank accounts. Can you please change my direct deposit information from going to bank account X to now going to bank account Y? And again, it's an executive of the company. So the person is, is taking- Eager the, to please and do it quickly. Absolutely. And, yeah. and so they'll, they'll do that outside of process where typically uh, there will be some sort of- Come down to form or go to the in, that's right. exactly. pool, employee portal and change that's right. it. That's right. Oh, well, I'm traveling you know, out of state this week. Can you just yep. get this handled for me? I mean, man. So it's really, it seems like the core of stuff like that is this desire for somebody to please or their mm-hmm. fear yes. of displeasing- Somebody that they're executive. For. Yes, it's yep. the classic exactly social right. engineering. It is. I mean, Kevin Mitnick was successful with mm-hmm. with social engineering twenty five years ago. Yep, thirty years ago. Yep, it's it's all it's all social engineering. Yeah, ultimately, because you're trying to get somebody to do something right on your behalf or for you, right? That they may not otherwise do. Yep. Whoa. So, how do you plan and build security in from the beginning of an implementation? What are the things that you you think about, do you think of, of various layers like the hardware, software, network, et cetera? So every company is different. So I, I've built security programs at a few different companies now. And generally what you want to do when you first go in is you need to do a risk assessment of the company mm. and find out, you know, a number of things like what, how do they do business? How do they make money? What's important to them? What sort of data is important to them? Because if you're, if you're in retail, if you're in online retail, you probably have millions of credit cards. So that's probably the most important thing to you. If you are more of a B2B type company, maybe you're in manufacturing like Gates is, uh, have a lot of intellectual property, 
that might be the most important thing oh, or your employee data might be the most important thing. So you need to look at the company from the standpoint of how it makes money, what it does, how it, how, and what's important to them to be able to identify where are some of the things you need to start focusing on first. And then you do a more holistic risk assessment across the organization and look at it from the standpoint of the policies they have in place, the compliance regulations that they're, that they're beholden to, the, uh, where they have encryption, where they, how, how they do secure software development, uh, all those various things. I, I do an assessment over about 30 different domains when I, when I do my risk assessments. And you look at them from a couple different angles. One is the risk exposure to the company if that area were to get exploited. And then the maturity level of that company on, a, let's say, a one to five scale on how well they are doing against that particular domain. And so if you have your high exposure areas and your low maturity areas, those kind of jump off the page as your double reds. And those are the areas you start focusing on first. Gotcha. But, but that's going to change for each individual company because they may have different programs and different things in place depending on you know, their existing awareness of security, their, their desire to implement it, uh, their stage of the company. Like There are various companies who start off building security in from the beginning. Uh, that's not common, but you do find companies who realize that if, based on what we're doing at this company, we need to make sure that based on the data that we're going to be holding, that we build security right away. Which then is there, where we are with the project we just took on. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then there are others who, you know, they're well down their their journey already before they decide, oh, you know, we're at a point now where we need to get, secu- we get serious about security and they start trying to figure it out. But then you're trying to layer security into processes Existing and applications. Processes, yeah. Yes. And that's that's more difficult to peel back that onion. It's much easier to try to build security into something as you're building and designing it, as opposed to trying to figure it out after it's already live or after it's already been developed. And that's and that's typically where some of the the headbutting occurs between security teams and engineering teams and project management uh. teams because Security is brought in at the end of the process and they say, okay, we've built this great and glorious thing that we spent the last six months on. Go make it secure. Yeah. yeah do a security <laughs> review on it. This and then you, and then, and then you find, change. exactly. This has to be you find 25 different things and then engineering and project management and everybody else in the business oh is getting God. mad at you because you're delaying my project, you're delaying my launch, you're delaying this, you're delaying that. Where if all of these things were discussed and identified as risks at, in the beginning, yeah. then you build it in as part of the design of the implementation of the project yeah. as opposed to trying to figure out how you're going to wedge that square peg into the round yeah. hole at the end. Interesting. This is such a fascinating subject because whether people realize it or not, there are a myriad of ways in any average person's life that this could impact them. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, yes. I, I don't know about particularly in terms of like devices and stuff. I, I've always had Apple devices and I feel like they do a pretty good job of making things pretty like locked down. But I remember, and I don't know if this is still happening, but I remember if, uh, maybe five or six years ago, there was that whole group of people that were walking around conferences, like with those little readers, scanners, mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. pulling credit card data from everybody who were, they were walking by. Mm-hmm. I mean, like you, you don't think about your card in your wallet being a problem. Mm-hmm. That, that's still, that still happens in some ways. Uh, the, the technology is still there that as you're, as you're storing this data on your phone, that it, it could potentially be stolen by someone. So you have to be very careful as to the, the types of, uh, there's, there's two sides of the coin, right? On one side, some of the technology is there to make life more convenient, yeah. but sometimes that convenience is what leads to the bad guys being able to just get access to what they want, get access to what they want very easily. Yeah. Right. You know, things like Bluetooth, for example, very convenient, but also a, a risk point. Right. Um, you know, connecting to open Wi-Fi networks and you have all this data passing in the clear, right? You don't, you don't think about it because you think about it from more of the convenience perspective of like, Hey, I can jump on Wi-Fi. I don't need a password. I can go do, you know, I can, I can do work. I can do my banking, et cetera, et cetera when you're not thinking about the aspect of the fact that all this data that you're now transmitting could potentially could be, be going, looked at by somebody else. Could be looked at by somebody else. Wow. Interesting. So let's talk for a little bit about IOT. So we have a client that has an IOT device that's essentially a portable thermostat for monitoring a dog's environment when your dog's traveling with you. So whether that's in an RV, I know you, you mm-hmm. RV and you do that mm-hmm. or, um, So whether that's in an RV or whether they're in a hotel room in a crate or something like that. And we have, we have found it a very interesting thing, building an IOT cloud environment, like the, the environment that actually ingests the data. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say any of this data is necessarily like high risk, 
But over time, the value in this company is in the data and the aggregating of it and collecting it and understanding, you know, how long does it take in a 2015 Subaru Outback without tinted windows in Denver in July? Mm -hmm. How long does it take to get, you know, and that's the kind of level of data that they have. So I'm just curious, do you have any experience with, you know, like IoT and like, are there different challenges with a manufactured device like that than there are with like a traditional web app or something. There are, there are certainly. And I think that's an other area where security is, is and security awareness, I'd say to some degree is somewhat lacking, right? Because uh, some of the original attacks, there was a, a botnet a couple of years ago called the Mirai, 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 however you want to pronounce it, botnet. And effectively what that was doing was taking advantage of people's home Wi-Fi routers that they had exposed to the internet And that we're using still default credentials because you can look up default credentials for pretty much any device out on the internet. And so what they were doing was getting into these devices and taking over these devices and basically making them machines on this network on the internet that was being used to attack other networks. wow. And that was kind of the the, the first real eye-opening event that was happening around what we'll call IoT. And IoT is a very broad statement, right? And with any any buzzword, it's getting more and more broad by the day as everybody Mm -hmm. tries to latch onto it and figure out how they can use the word (laughs) IoT in their marketing material. That's right. right? Almost as much as blockchain. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. So that, that was, that was the first kind of eye opening moment of like, wow, we need to be paying more attention to these internet connected devices because as we are allowing more and more things to connect to the internet, like our, even our refrigerators and coffee makers and what things about like that. The cars now. And cars. Tesla and, and cars. And Absolutely. That to me, that's what one thing that worried me was like, what if you lose connection? <laughs> what, well, what if you, what if your or vehicle is compromised and someone takes it over and decides to run you off the road? I mean, I, or what if someone turns off your refrigerator and everything in the refrigerator gets spoiled? Or so, you know, it, it, they're, yeah. they, they seem like minor examples, but when you think about them in kind of a broader context of how all of this technology presents another area, another thing that someone could potentially get a hold of and do something with. Yeah. Uh, let, I'll, take, I'll take a real life example in manufacturing, right? So we're incorporating IoT devices on our systems to be able to give us more data as to when a particular manufacturing device or some production line device may be trending towards some kind of failure, right? So maybe it starts running a bit hotter, uh, maybe it starts or it slows down a or little, or it slows down, or yeah. maybe its defect rates a little bit higher than it normally is. Right, things things that are KPIs, key performance indicators, that can help you determine that something may be going wrong with the machine before it's actually it down. Crashes. Yeah, and it's completely offline, and it's not producing product, and it's not generating revenue. Right, so how can you utilize the data that's coming off of these devices to be able to create those trend indicators so that you know when something might be trending in the wrong direction? And that's where businesses are starting to use this as well, is how do we use the data in a more predictive fashion to be able to, maybe it's predict sales funnels, predict uh, sales patterns, for example. Like maybe uh, you're, you've had your car for three years and you, you know, they think that, well, maybe you'll be interested in buying a new car. And so they can start using some of that data uh, and how many, maybe it's how many miles you put on your car. Ah. So, you, so maybe you have a, a certain make and model of vehicle and they have these IoT devices and sensors on them that allow to, you know, data to get sent up to their their mothership and they're like, Hey, you've, you've, you've put 50,000 miles on your car. Now, do you want to think about, or your warranty's up, right? You had a 48,000 mile warranty, your warranty's up. How about you come into the dealership and take a look at this new vehicle and have a new brand new warranty on a new car? Yeah. I, I, I mean, can th- tell you, you, you could buy a brand new car and within the year they're sending you those emails yeah. out. So, sure. But sure. I get your point. Yeah. The, the point being that there's, there's data flying everywhere right. now and, and, and it's coming off of these devices that we're using on a regular basis. And some are for support purposes, some are for sales purposes, some are for preventative maintenance purposes, but there's the data lakes that companies are accumulating now as a result of the amount of information that's being generated off of these devices is huge. Yeah. And there's going to be opportunity there from a business standpoint, to be able to capitalize on that, but also from a security perspective, again, because security hasn't really caught up very well with how to implement security in some of these IoT devices, whether they're home Wi-Fi routers, whether these sensors on these devices, maybe they're apps that control these devices. Uh, There's going to be opportunity there for the bad guys to be able to figure out how to get into these things. We've heard for the past few years in the medical field about hackers potentially being able to take over, you know, the devices that are in people's rooms that are keeping them alive. This was a problem with pacemakers because the yes. current model yes. pacemakers actually have a, a an internet connection mm-hmm. for over the air updates yep. in case oh they my. have an issue. Yep. When Dick Cheney got his pacemaker mm-hmm. inserted, this was almost 10 years ago now, I think, 
they had to go find one that was an old school pacemaker that didn't do that. Mm -hmm. It must have been, and that must have been when he when he was still in office. But anyway, they had to go find one that didn't do that mm -hmm. because it was such a huge security risk. Wow. Well, think about that. Like, what what if what if somehow the company that makes a set of pacemakers gets compromised in some way, and some bad update gets pushed down to a hundred thousand people's pacemakers that and jacks up the the electromagnetic right. pulse and yep. essentially fries them from the inside. Yeah. I yeah. mean, yep. Yeah. That could be hundreds of thousands of people all at yes. once. I mean, it sounds very extreme, but it's it's an example of something that could happen yeah. given the right scenario, given the right circumstances. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. is where, you know, security starts to get into the the physical world as well. Yeah. Because, you know, it's not just about a computer. A somewhere. computer. It's not about a computer. It's not about, it's not about stealing money. money. Right, exactly. It it could be it could be loss of life. Wow. It could be a terrorist attack, basically. Could be. A lot of these I can I could I think of airplanes think that, in, way that in they, they seem yeah. so fragile to me mm -hmm. with all their control systems. So should people not have these things or is there a way like that the average person could take just a couple of simple steps or is it simple to protect yourself against the majority of this stuff? And how do you do that? I mean, don't use the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, the, the ultimate problem they're going to run into is that this is where everything is going. Yeah. Right. There's going to be a time where these internet connected devices are the only things you can buy. Like there's not yeah. going to be the, you know, the, the dumb refrigerator thermostat. and the smart refrigerator right. or the dumb thermostat and the smart thermostat. Right. So it's, it's just, it's where it's going. And so, I mean, for now, if you're buying these devices, understand what the risks are associated with them and, and understand how to, how to protect them. Yeah. You know, for, as a, as a simple mechanism, change the default passwords on them. I mean, mm -hmm. this is, this is true for pretty much any device you have, but for things that are internet connected that could potentially be used mm -hmm. to get into your home or get into your company network or get yeah. into your whatever. I mean, that's the easiest path to get in is when people don't change the default credentials on something. And that's, that, that's the simplest thing to do, but. And it happens all the time, It happens right? all the time. And, and that's, and that's how this Mirai botnet that came around a few years ago, that's how it got literally hundreds of thousands of devices on the network because of the fact that these people would just, like you get, they'd go to Best Buy, they'd buy a router from off the shelf, they'd plug it into their, their cable modem at home. And, and off and running. And off and running, because it as worked. As long as they can connect. Yeah. They're, it's, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. As soon as it worked, now, they just walked away from it. I'm just thinking about my uh, Bluetooth shower speaker right now, because it, like it's, I think when it, when I wanted to connect to the instruction said, just pass, put, push zero, 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 zero mm -hmm. to uh. connect. And I'm like, now I'm thinking, what if somebody was standing outside my house and could connect to that that easily? Could they, you know, if I'm connected on my phone to that Bluetooth device, am I, did I just open up the, you know, the drawbridge mm -hmm. and huh. let somebody in? Yeah. Jeez. Interesting. And when you hear someone while you're in the shower singing with just the terrible voice, <laughs> yeah. you'll know. You're like, wait, I usually sound better than that. <laughs> I got hacked while I was in the shower. Yeah. That sounds pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> or you start hearing Miley Cyrus through your uh, Bluetooth shower speaker. Like, right. Wait a second. <laughs> That's not on my list. It's my playlist. Uh, fascinating. Like super fascinating. All right. So like I said earlier, we've been talking a lot about blockchain. I want to know what you think about it, where you think it is, what are the challenges? You know, there's this, there's this common perception among the average person that, oh, this is unhackable, which, you know, with the 51% problem, I think we've proven is not true, but what, what are the challenges with getting to a place where something like blockchain would be meaningful in society? Does it help solve any of the security problems? I, I think it helps. There, there's a lot of benefit that can be gleaned from, from blockchain. Uh, you know, certainly having an immutable ledger, you know, to help prove elements of a transaction, right, are certainly very important when you think about things like bank transfers or uh, in medical use cases. You know, there's lots of good use cases for them. But I think at this point, at least based on what I can see, it seems like people are still trying to feel their way around it and really trying to understand what the use cases could be. Yeah, I, It doesn't seem to me like there's any real practical application for it yet. It's just a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of buzz and yeah. a lot of, a lot of possibility, but from what I've seen, not a whole lot of like concrete implementation that's providing value and security. Yeah. And I, I could be, I could be wrong there. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's lots of people doing some really cool things. Yeah. Uh, but at least from what I've been seeing just in the, in the practical space, it seems to me at this point that it's still very, very hand wavy. Research and development. Yeah. yeah. Hand wavy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cryptocurrency oriented. Yeah. 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 Everybody. Yeah, it's almost like you, it's almost like you don't even hear the word. We were talking about this on a podcast a couple of weeks ago, where you you almost don't even hear the word blockchain without some form of cryptocurrency 
following directly behind yes. it because that's sort of how people conceptualize it, right? Well, and that, that's kind of where it came from, I guess. That's, that's the most mainstream yeah. use of it today. Yeah. Huh. I think just the fact that you don't have a single centralized ledger that can be attacked is, is a good thing for the safety. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Interesting. Um, okay. So we are a tech incubator and we, we, uh, our passion is entrepreneurs and startups, particularly at a very early stage, although we do get involved with startups that are in various stages of development. If you were talking to a group of entrepreneurs, say anything pre series a, what would you say to them about, you know, how, how do they protect themselves? How, how what should they be thinking about? What should they be looking at? And how important is it to spend money, spend time, spend attention thinking about security and when should mm -hmm. they be doing it? Yeah. I, as I mentioned earlier, right, the earlier you build security into a process, a procedure, a project, uh, whatever you're building, it's going to be cheaper for you down the road. I mean, so if you're in a, if you're in that early phase where, you know, your pre-series A phase where you're, you're trying to build and innovate relatively quickly, but at the same time, you're trying to keep your costs down. I mean, that's, that's a good way to be able to kind of meld those two things together because it, when, when done the right way, when, when built in from the beginning, security doesn't slow you down. It, it helps you build a product the right way in such a fashion that uh, you'll have a better product when it comes to market. Yeah. And so, you know, from my perspective and my, I'm, I'm, I may be somewhat biased, you know, given, <laughs> given my role, but you know, from, from my perspective, then I see it all the time, right? The earlier you get involved, the earlier you're thinking about how things can potentially be abused, right? Because yeah. ultimately, once something is in the hand of an end user, whether that's uh, someone who's a customer or someone who's a bad guy, who's was trying to figure out how to break what you've built, the more you have that model built in from the beginning, then it's, it's not, it's software. It's never going to be unbreakable, right? right? So as we talk about you know, these unbreakable, unhackable technologies, those don't exist. No. You know, when you have people out there saying that, you know, my technology is unhackable, you've basically just asked yourself to become a target. Exactly. And within about... 20 minutes, you'll probably be owned. <laughs> so, Challenge accepted. Yeah, exactly. So, but so if you think about that from the standpoint of how you want to position your product, service, whatever it is, right? Think about how what you're building for good can potentially be misused. Uh. And that is how it's going to be misused. And so if you're collecting sensitive information, if you're collecting credit card information, if you're collecting payment data, if you're collecting personal data, especially now in an age of GDPR and other new privacy regulations, there are, there is a huge shift in who owns the information that a client, that a customer gives you now. Interesting. Right. Where before, uh, the data was owned mostly by the companies now, because of these privacy regulations and the things for right to correct, right to erasure, things like that, companies don't really own that data anymore. Interesting. It, the data really is owned by the person. The person. And the person can tell you what they want you to do with their information. Yeah. So the, the, the limits are becoming much more strict as to how that data can be used. So again, think about that from the standpoint of not only security, but also privacy, because you don't want to be on the wrong end. Even though you may not be a big company, uh, that doesn't mean that if you have a breach of some kind, if it's large enough or important enough, that the data protection authorities aren't going to come down on you. Or if yeah. you're in breach of the, the California Consumer Protection Act, which is actually in some ways more strict than GDPR, uh, that they won't come after you and you won't have some heavy fines to pay. And as a small company, you know, will you have the ability to recover from something? Yeah. Like that? It's interesting because you, when you started, when you started this answer, you said, think about your, think about the end user, both your target user and a potential hacker. That's a really interesting way to look at it. Like it's not just that the intended user is the person you have to be thinking about, but unintended right. users. Exactly and you right. have to put on your malevolent hat. Yeah. At that point too and think mischievously and mm -hmm. like, how could I, yes. that makes me really like thinking about when we do our customer personas for our various yeah. startups, we have them do market research and we figure out a few different personas that we, you know, demographic type profiles. And it almost seems like we should throw in a persona for bad guy. Yeah, like yeah. who who would who would want access to the data that's going to come out of this system, mm -hmm. and how could they use it nefariously? Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. thinking about that in terms of how then do you protect from that? So do you spend your whole day being suspicious of like everyone you meet? <laughs> I don't trust anybody. <laughs> <laughs> 
I noticed he turned his phone and his watch off when he walked in the room. I know he <laughs> did. I know. You know, we we were talking. Uh, this has been a little while, but so we had we had this experience, and I want I want you to tell us what you think about this. But Grant and Daryl and I were sitting in the office. D- David was talking about how we bought a purple bed. Grant never searched it. He literally just his computer and his phone were in the room where we were talking about it. And that night he started getting ads for purple beds. Mm -hmm. Almost right away. Like, how did that yeah. happen? Is it's, the phone and the computer like actively listening? It's it's scary, right? Is it, it, it's, you hear this on a fairly regular basis from people too. Like I was just having a conversation about X. I'd never actually done a search for X, but now I'm getting ads about X. Yeah. Uh, this this is where some of the technology starts to uh, start to invade your personal life, right? Yeah. Because because when you have things like, and they say they're only recording when it's actually turned on. Like if you go to Siri, for example, it's, it says it's only recording what, you, what you're saying when Alexa it's actually turned on. Alexa says that too. Alexa says that too. But it has to constantly be listening. For its keyword. Tr- for its trigger yeah. words. Yeah. That's right. And so I, while, they, while the marketing literature says one thing, I, nobody really knows yeah. what's going on. I, I'm not saying anybody's doing anything they're not supposed to be doing. But at the end of the day... How like, does it really work? How does it really you know? work? I, I don't, yeah. Nobody really knows what's inside the black box yeah. and how the black box really works. Yeah, because I was hearing about the smart TVs, the voice activated TVs mm-hmm. that, you know, people were finding. Yeah, And not everybody is, you know, benevolent. And there, yeah. there, was, there was something about a, uh, a stuffed animal or a doll or something mm-hmm. that actually got updates and they found out that it's transmitting these children's conversations. Yeah. I was actually going to talk about that in a minute. So uh, I actually did a, a story on Nine News a couple of years ago uh, around Christmas time. And it was when, I forget what the name of the toy was, but some smart toy was the big thing that year. And the story was all about these smart toys and how they're always listening and how, because they have to be, right? Because they're listening for certain trigger words, keywords, but they're also intended to converse with the child yeah. as well. And so they have some sort of algorithms that they build in based off of what the child says or asks or whatever they, that it responds. But, the story was around, you know, all the information that these toys could be collecting from your children. Because your, your your children play with their toys. They they give some of their, you know, th- intimate thoughts and sure. feelings and, you know, whatever it is. Whether they're ta- mad. A special friend is here visiting. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or maybe they're <laughs> mad at their brother or sister or whatever. Like that. They, they say lots of things yeah. to their toys in the privacy of their room that they don't say when they're out in the family or in public or right. whatever. And so all this information being collected, I mean, it's, it's kind of scary to think about what that information could be used for, but that, but you're right that these, these devices always have to be listening in some, to some passive way. That's yeah. why I'm scared. I don't have an Alexa or a Siri kind of thing because that bothers me that I don't want to think somebody's listening. Although I kind of live my life like I'm in a camera view everywhere, yeah. wherever I am, there's probably a camera that can see what I'm doing right now. Yeah. You know, even, you know, I'm sitting at the stoplight, you go to pick your nose and you realize there's cameras right up there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so David is a, he loves gadgets, all kinds of gadgets, kitchen gadgets, tech gadgets, whatever it is. He's Mm -hmm. constantly on Kickstarter. We were, we were on three different Kickstarter campaigns for like robot butler things. The first two didn't come to fruition. The third one did. She's sitting in our living room right now. Her name's Temmie. And the thing about these things is we have Nest cameras, we have Nest thermostats, we have four or five Alexas and Echo Dots and everything's all over our house. I, you know, I mean, I think about this, that sometimes I'm walking around and I'm like, like the other day I had, I had left my laundry in the dryer and my towel was in there too. And so literally like I'm standing in the bathroom and I'm like, I am going to run through my whole house in front of three different cameras. <laughs> Buck naked and dripping wet because I forgot to grab the towels out. And I was like, I guess Nest, whoever's monitoring this is getting mm-hmm. a show, you know, but. I thought you were going to say, Alexa said, the towel is in the dryer. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's, that, what's that meme? You know, my wife told me a joke. I laughed. My wife laughed. Alexa laughed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I had something happen. Um, it was about two months ago, but I suddenly was getting t- all these text messages from numbers I didn't recognize. Mm-hmm with like nice greetings and a link. And I immediately recognize, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to follow a link if I don't know who that person is anyway, mm-hmm. but that's another, partially because yeah. I've got a technology background. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. People started calling me saying, who is this? And it's like, yeah. did you not pick up when you got like five texts 
from unknown numbers that there's possibly something going on. Right. Yeah. Right. Obviously, Republic Wireless or Verizon had been. I get those two. Had okay. been hacked mm-hmm. in some fashion well, because and, they were going out. You know, I got like 12 of them in an hour. Mm-hmm. They've gotten really good at spoofing like random phone numbers. Phone numbers. Yeah. So, so they're, they're spoofing our actual numbers. numbers. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They don't even have to be like available numbers that nobody's using for them to, you know, mm-hmm. man. But it's just like with email, right? That's it's It started with email where people would spoof emails from people that appear to be trusted, just like with these scams mm-hmm. we were talking about earlier, right? So they, the the intention of the scammer is to get you to react before you can think. Yeah. And uh, if they if they can establish an immediate mm-hmm. level of trust to get you to, to react before you can think about something, then they got you. They got you. Is it always they have to establish trust or do they sometimes use fear? Excitement. Both. Fear. Okay. Both. Both. Or maybe excitement. Yeah. With money. But, Some kind of strong reaction. Yes is what they're going for. Yes. Some level of urgency, Meet some level of fear. in your area. Yeah, that would be grants. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to what you said from our responsibility, I remember when it was trivially easy, we would jokingly send each other emails from like Bill G at Microsoft.com. Yeah. Right? I sent the email, but they it appeared to my coworker, they knew it, it wasn't Bill yeah. G, right? But yeah. that's how little to no security was built into the email system. You could actually early, send an email on, to make yeah. it look like it was sent from someone else. Yeah. still works that way. Yeah. It, it actually does still work that way. Yeah. yeah. There, um, there are some technologies that are built in now or not built in, but you can bolt on to help detect some of those spoofings sure. when they occur. But as the, the, the email easy. protocol at its core hasn't changed. Right. Yeah. yeah. It still allows for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that's where, but that's where what you were saying is mm-hmm. we have to be as engineers cognizant of that and to, from the get go, either bolt that onto the email system mm-hmm. or build the new technology with that in mind so that you can't thinking that way of, all right, well, I can send this email. Can some other guy make yeah. it? You, know what I mean? you just have to follow Sam's mantra, trust no one. That's yes. right. <laughs> so do you have smart devices and stuff like that? And are you just better at knowing what the risk is and you, you know, or. I, I, I think we all, we all have smart devices in some yeah. way. I mean, I, I don't have an Alexa or anything like that. Uh, I don't have any of those. Um, but you know, I wear a wa- smart watch. Okay. Right. And so I, we all, we all have things within our home that are considered smart devices in some way. I think my, my cameras are probably smart cameras as well. Uh, but I don't have anything like the, the constant listening, you know, the okay. Alexas or the. Okay. And there. that's on purpose. That's, that's not just purpose. cause you haven't gotten around to it. No, it's on purpose. Yeah. It's on purpose. Okay. And plus as I look at it, at least for me anyway, uh, I don't necessarily find the utility in them. Mm. Like I, you know, i I ask people like, what do you use this for? Like, what do you really use your Alexa for? Oh, you know, I use it to play music. Yeah. Like, all right. I don't need an Alexa to play music. Yeah. Right. You know, or I use it to add to our, my, my, my wife and I shopping list. Okay. I don't need an Alexa to do that. Yeah. So like as yeah. much new technology, it's the, the it's the cool factor. The cool. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I just, you know, from, from my perspective and the way I live my life, I just look at it and I'm like, eh, I don't I'm not willing to trade privacy for cool. That's right. Yeah. So we, or for whatever convenience that's giving me, like, you know, like I can play music easier. I can add something to my shopping list easier. Okay. Okay. I'll pick up a pen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing that we use it for all the time, and I go back and forth on this and you're going to, you're going to understand why when I tell you, but we have some like smart switches and smart lamps and mm-hmm. like some kind of not smart home, like mm-hmm. not that level, but just things where like, if I walk in the door, I can be like, Alexa, turn on welcome, you know, and then she'll turn on the lights where I am. Mm-hmm. And the one time I realized like how crazy that could really get, we had a really weird power surge and it, and it was like two 30 in the morning and her process of starting mm. back up, she turned everything in the house on oh, nice. at two 30 in the morning. David and I about died of heart attacks <laughs> because here she is talking and it was coming out all garbled because mm-hmm. she had a power surge and she was having weird stuff going on. And then every light in our house came on mm-hmm. and I mean the disorientation right. and I mean, that was just a power surge that somebody wasn't even trying to do something nefarious. Sure. They're here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but you have things are controlling other things in your house. Exactly. But think about the benefit there too. So, Let's say you go on vacation. Yeah. Right. You don't want to give the perception that you're not home. Yes. And so you can set something like you use your home automation to be able to have lights turn on and off. You At know, different, times. different times. So you actually give it like a range. Yes. And it will like go early in the range or a little later. Right. Like it's right. not the same time every time. We right. do use that too. Yeah. So there are some benefits you can gain from a yeah. security standpoint as a result of that too. But to your point, right? It 
when you have devices that are controlling other things in your house like that, you yeah. don't you you give up some element of control. Yeah, and yeah. and and I I am also engineering background, so you know I know not to leave default passwords and stuff like that, and I'm pretty good about you know managing all that. But I I'm not. I mean I don't even have your level of understanding of things by and not even close. So I'm sure that you could come into my house and be like, oh look at these, and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I still think my my idea of driving through a, a really nice neighborhood with a bullhorn saying, Alexa, open the garage door <laughs> would be uh, would yeah. work for somebody. Well, you, you've, uh, you, there's been instances in the uh, in the news as well of people having their Alexa device too close to their uh, voicemail. Oh. And so people have left voicemail <laughs> saying like, Alexa, you know, do something. Yeah. And Alexa hears it Does because it? it's close to the voicemail recorder. And that's well, hilarious. that's like um, they had a news story about something that Alexa was doing that was really cute for for Christmas. And the news story aired. They said the thing and like they had reports of like 250,000 homes where all of a sudden Alexa started doing the thing right. and it, it wigged people out. Yeah, yeah, it was something it was something like that wigged people out. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious. You're familiar with DEF CON, I'm sure. Right. Yes. Uh, been there many been? times. Yeah. Have you? Yes. Do what you, is that you, for our, so our audience? You want to yeah, DEF so, uh, so DEF CON is a uh, security conference that happens in Las Vegas every year. Uh, as security conferences get bigger, they they tend to morph and change over time. So it's not it's not the way it used to be. It used to be a pretty hardcore, rough crowd. Yeah. I'll put in some ways, um, but it's still it's still one of those places where there is a lot of I'll just say technology that is tested while you're there. Uh. So it's something you have to be very careful of when you bring your <laughs> bring your devices because uh, you know that people are constantly kind of poking and trying different things to see if they could uh oh. the, in fact the, I, I don't know if they still have it but they used to have this thing called the wall of sheep. And the wall of sheep was basically like if you got, you know, some device compromised in some way then your your name would end up on oh. this wall. It's like like a wall of shame if you will. <laughs> right. Gotcha. Oh yeah. man. Yeah. 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 So I think the casinos have are really focused on security and their systems. I would systems. think you would they, have to, absolutely. especially with how, how slot machines in these games are all digital now. I mean, there's got to be risks of hacking in and yeah, forcing results. Being able to walk up with something on my phone and, and just stand in front and say, jackpot. Jackpot, jackpot. yeah. Right. I'm sure it could be done by somebody. Yeah. Interesting. So do you when you go to DEF CON, do you keep your phone turned off? I do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's not going to be a sheep. Nope. I will what, not end up on the wall. What kind of phone do you have? <laughs> iPhone. iPhone, okay. Interesting. Do you, you don't take your smartwatch either? Yes, I'm sure all the listeners would like to know I, what devices Sam uses. Yeah, yeah. I want to get those. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I bring my watch with me. I bring the phone with me, but I I, I very rarely have it on or okay. using it. Or if I if I need to use it, I'll turn it on to use it for that thing. Yeah, and then turn, and it, then off. turn it off. Yeah, okay. and with the watch, yeah, the watch is just Bluetooth with the phone. Sure. So, so if it, the phone's not on, then it still works. Yeah. as a watch. Gotcha. Okay, wow. gotcha. Interesting. All right, so. Um, I don't have one of the fancy new or uh, Wi-Fi Apple watches. Yeah. Actually, like, like you connect to Wi-Fi. Yeah. And GP, uh, uh, not GPS. You don't even need Wi-Fi for some of the newer ones, right? It's, no, it's you don't. cellular, yeah. actually. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. That's crazy. All right, cool. Well, this has been enlightening and terrifying all at the same time. <laughs> uh, we, You're welcome. We are very, very grateful <laughs> that you came uh, on the show today and talked to us. And I'm sure, I'm certain that our users are going to get a lot out of it. Uh, if you guys have any questions for Sam or um, something came up and you're like, what does that mean? Uh, Twitter us post on the blog, you know, ask a question, find us on LinkedIn and, and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll get you some answers. Um, so before we part, any last thoughts or anything that you always tell people as like, if you're going to do one thing today, here's what I'd recommend you do to protect yourself. Freeze your credit. Mm. Freeze your credit. Uh, you know, with some of the breaches that have occurred with like Experian, for example, yeah. uh, even not just Experian, but you know, your, your data is already out there. Whether, whether, no matter how good of a job you try to do to protect your personal information, it, it, the number of people that you give that data to just because of life, yeah, right? It's, it's out there on the internet. It's, it's already been compromised many different ways. You probably, many of you have probably had credit card numbers stolen at one point or yep. another as well as yep. a result of, comp, of credit card breaches. So I would say if there's one thing I would suggest you do, and I, I know we haven't talked about this at all over the course of the podcast today, but um, if I were to leave you with one thing to think about, it's the amount of information that, that is out there about you already, how that information could be used against you in some way. And one of the most damning ways that can happen is by having someone 
impersonate your identity, start opening up accounts with your name and ruin your credit because it yeah. takes years and years and years to recover from that. And in the meantime, you can't take out a loan. You can't get a credit card. I mean, like everybody is, all the banks, every financial institution is looking upon you like you're some sort of pariah. So freeze your credit uh, through all three credit bureaus. Don't just pick one of them, pick all three. Um, you is, hard, that, is that a free process and is it hard? It is it, free now. It is free now and it is not hard. Okay. Um, you very rarely need your credit for any specific reason. Like if you're going to open up a new loan or a new credit card, how often do you do that yeah. relative to how often your credit is wide open, right? Yeah. Your credit is open 365 days a year and you need it Three maybe, times. Maybe three times, yeah. maybe less than that. Yeah. Right? That's leaving the front door open all the time because I go out to the front, you know, go yeah. get the paper. That's a great analogy. Now that's a great then. analogy. Yeah. Yes. And it's it. free to thaw your credit now. It and is. oh, that's you nice. can, you can, when you thaw it, you can say, I only want it thawed for, for this, this particular time or, week. Yep. or for that particular company. Yep. Oh, interesting. Yep. You can attach and what I'll do too, if when I'm going to, if I need a line of credit for something, I will ask them, which credit bureau are you going to check? And I'll just unlock that one. That one. And then, and then lock it back it down. Back. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, it just leaves some, it just leaves less. No problem with any of that kind of stuff, right? They, nope. Cool. Nope. Nope. Not at all. Yeah. Because they realize that more and more people are now doing this yeah. Yeah. as a that's result really of good the for them. Absolutely. Usually, Absolutely. If, if more people are doing that. Yep. Yeah. Brilliant. The, the credit bureaus, I don't think are big fans of it, but after, after the Experian fiasco, you know, uh, the government basically said, okay, you're done. Yeah. You can't yeah. charge for this anymore. Yep. Yeah. You guys are clearly yep. not trustworthy. So you have yeah. to do this for free now. It's huh? far too important. Yeah, it's it far is. too important. Mm. It is. Interesting. Okay. Not where I thought you were going to go, but that's actually, that's brilliant, yeah, that's brilliant useful. advice. Mm -hmm. Super useful advice. We're all doing it right now. That's right. Right now. <laughs> it's like on my list now. All right, cool. Well, Sam Massiello. Massiello. Yeah. I did it again. <laughs> Damn it. Sam Massiello, uh, Chief Information Security <laughs> Officer for Gates Corporation. Um, we really, really, really have enjoyed having you. You're Thank welcome you anytime. Um, and uh, thanks so much for offering so much wisdom and so much to think about. Thank it's you. It's a huge area and clearly you have been in it a long time and you're very, very well versed. My pleasure. And, and thank you for uh, your time as well. It's been fun being here. Yeah, good. Thanks. Um, all right, guys. So this has been uh, probably the Rika show and Incubate This. I think we're going to probably co-brand this um, so that everybody gets it because it's been some really good content. Freeze your credit, protect yourself, um, and for God's sake, change your password on your router. <laughs> uh, we'll talk to you guys next time. 